الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونتوب إليه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بدون أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون هذا الله أوصيكم وإياي بتقوى الله أوصيكم وإياي بتقوى الله أوصيكم وإياي بتقوى الله واذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ كنتم أعداء فألف بين قلوبكم فأصبحتم بنعمته إخوانا وكنتم على شفا حفرة من النار فأنقلكم منها الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام الحمد لله على نعمة الإيمان الحمد لله على نعمة القرآن الحمد لله على نعمة حبيبنا وسيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين الحمد لله على نعمه كلها ظاهرها وباطنها الحمد لله على نعمة يوم الجمعة يوم يتلاقى فيه المسلمون ويتلاقى فيه المؤمنون ويتبادلون السلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أما بعد Today what I wanted to address or contextualize is speak about immigration, renewal, and also to think of our future. But I want to put the issue of immigration from the prophetic tradition, not only Prophet Muhammad وسلم, but also the narrative of almost all of the prophets. Now one can actually also extend it even beyond the prophets in this world to begin with. Is actually we could begin it with Adam alayhi salam because Adam in essence is an immigrant from the heavens to the worldly plane. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had brought Adam and Eve into this realm and we could say that that was a an act of immigration or a, fun, a, a form of immigration. The reason I wanted to speak about immigration is the current debate that we have in this country. And especially the four-point plan uh, that have been put forth during the uh, <coughs> President State of the Union. And two pieces of, those, of this plan is very important. One is the <laughs> or the dreamers, which is the young kids that were brought to this country at an early age. But the fourth point, where the president spoke about stopping or ending chain migration. And I want to focus on this concept of chain migration. So I'll get back to this. First, to speak about the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now, Prophet Ibrahim السلام, as we know from the narrative, he was born, raised in present-day Mesopotamia or present-day Iraq. And then his family and tribe persecuted him. So much so that his own father actually issued the judgment again to be thrown in the, in the fire. Allah intervened with the angels and says, Ya naru kuni bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. O fire be cool and safe on Ibrahim and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rescued him. But from that we know that the narrative of the Quran said that Ibrahim and Lut alayhum as salam and their family migrated out and ended up in the land of Canaan or the land of Al Kanaaniyun, one of the early branches of the Arabs. Right? So the land of Canaan is present-day Palestine. Now the interesting part is that Ibrahim and Lut, when they said, when they were migrating, they said, إِنِّي ذَهِبٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّي سَيَهْدِينَ That the act of migration, they said, we're going toward our Lord to guide us. Which for us, we could get an, an indication <laughs> that the act of migration Right? can read or part embedded in it is a search for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this case both Ibrahim 
and Mut saying that the going out of Mesopotamia to the land of Canaan, Palestine, was an act to search for and arrive to, or to be in the companionship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have the act of migration, and that act of migration we are still benefiting of it till today because we are on the path or we are the Ummah of Ibrahim right? We are the progeny or the lineage of Ibrahim So the act of migration actually created renewal Because from the lineage of Ibrahim you have both the lineage of prophets that goes to Bani Israel and as well as Ismail and then from the lineage of Ismail alayhi salam we get the birth of the Prophet sallallahu so migration resulted in renewal resulted in connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so again immigration, renewal and future now let's take a look at the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, Joseph. Now look at the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. His own brothers, in act of jealousy, they throw him into the water well. Act of jealousy, his own brothers. And why? They said, if we get him out of the way, maybe our father's heart will lean toward us. And so again, eliminating what they thought to be the competition because Yusuf and Benjamin, his brother, from another mother, were far more beloved to their father, at least outwardly thinking so. So they throw him in <coughs> the job or the water well. And a group of sayyara or a caravan comes and pick him up from the water well. And then they sell him into slavery. Bisa'ar al in a very small amount of money. Literally, they were thinking that this is just, we can't do much with this kid. So they sold him into slavery. And he ends up in Egypt. Now, in here we could compare this to the history of African Americans that were brought to this country, right, as slaves as a commodity, بِسِعْرِ الْبَخْسِ in a very, very small price. Sometimes actually it was far more expensive to buy an ox than to buy a slave. And you could actually, a slave would die usually in three years because they don't attend it, they'll attend more to the animal because they thought of it as a much better investment because it's again, you could get from it all types of byproducts. So, think of Yusuf alayhi salam immigrating to Egypt involuntarily. And we say African Americans are involuntary immigrants to the United States. So, immigration, arrival, the arrival of Yusuf alayhi salam to Egypt, again, you get him to be sent to jail. If we don't have this example with African Americans, that tend to be one in three African Americans end up in jail in a very highly tilted judicial system in here. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also with Yusuf, he was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always overseeing him because again he was being given guidance and revelation, rises up and becomes a minister in the house of Pharaoh. Right? Rises up. Now, in here I want to see when Yusuf meets his brothers when they were coming to trade and the narrative in Surah Yusuf says that he recognizes his brother and his brother recognizes him he invites all of his family to come to Egypt. Right? Come to Egypt. Now, for those who are reading this narrative in which part of that narrative can they say Yusuf was engaged in chain migration? So we shift the language from family reunification to actually using the term chain migration, depersonalize, decontextualize, dehumanize an essence of the human being, which is to actually have family reunification. 
So the language that is being used is to create a mental frame. Instead of thinking family, children, wives, husband, grandparents, grandfather, we actually do personal because nobody thinks of their lineage or the family as a chain. Completely depersonalized and also conceptualizing a threat of it. So for those who argue, and again, some in the right wing these days are hanging on this chain migration framing, right? I would say they are violating the text, the biblical text they're reading, reading the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. Because again, from involuntarily being moved to Egypt, to rising up, to bringing his family, that gives us the lineage of Yusuf, and then from the lineage of Yusuf comes Moses alayhi salam. Now getting to our own tradition, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right. Our history begins in terms of our calendar. Year one is connected to the Hijrah, migration. So you cannot be a Muslim without thinking to the centrality of migration. Right. Migration of the Prophet that's one. But even before that, we had a migration of 83 of the companions, including Uthman radiallahu an, including the daughter of the Prophet to Abyssinia. The first Muslim community to practice Islam freely was the one that went to Habasha. Much earlier, almost seven years before, the Muslims were able to pray freely in Medina. So migration and religious freedom and the ability to articulate Islam in Abyssinia. And then the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina to start the first community that is made up of two pieces. Islam was formed in the first community of two pieces. Al-Muhajirun and Al-Ansar. Right? Those who engaged in migration and those who engaged or became their helpers. Now, I have not seen in history any example where a community of Muhajireen arrived to a store place and the place actually divided all its wealth, all its resources, all of its community in half with the arriving group. There is not a single, again, I challenge anyone to go and read Chinese history, African history, European history, American history. Canadian history today, right, where they're, what you call, often give us the rhetoric of inclusion, but actually practice exclusion on every turn. There is not a single case in history where those who are migrating with nothing are given half of everything that is belong to that society who is actually invited them. Not only that, at the foundation of Medina, and again, this is just to conceptualize, the Prophet right, is an immigrant to Medina and he is actually appointed to lead the community. Now if you don't understand the Arab tribal structure, if you don't understand the boastfulness of tribes, for them to actually have the Prophet lead them, shows you the significance and the impact and the transformation that Islam brought to in the act of Hijrah and the starting of a new society that is no longer connected to patterns of tribe, family, and lineage in the way that was experienced. It was a complete transformation. So again, the act of immigration in Islam creates a new society which today and here in America we're benefiting because had it not been for the community that's in Medina, Islam would have been extinguished in Mecca and we would not have been able to transform the both the Arabian Peninsula and through it all parts of the Muslim world. Another aspect for the centrality of Hijrah. Many of those who went to Habasha, to Abyssinia, came back, part of them came back to the Arabian Peninsula, but part actually went to various parts of Asia. 
Some of the early arrivals of the companions made it to the Indian subcontinent. Some went as far as China. Professor Cezat Adib Bajul, who documented the history of Asia, he said some of the companions that were in Habasha ended up in the Indian subcontinent and parts of the coastal Asia, and they became the beginning of conversion and inviting to Islam as companions. So again, if you go to India, you'll find some of the mosques actually date as early as 6th day. The earliest mosques in India subcontinent in the south from the year 6th day, where actually some of the communities came and met the Prophet in Medina and went back and built the mosque in 6th day. And the mosque is still stand there. So if you actually land in uh, Kuchin and you drive about two hours, the mosque is still there and the Hindu community gave a gift to the mosque and the gift is still hanging in the middle of the mosque today. So the act of migration resulted in renewal, transformation and building new centers and new places where people can articulate Islam. So what I wanted to say that you cannot study the prophetic tradition both from Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam to Yusuf to Moses, to Noah, without thinking of migration. Also, you can't study the history of prophetic traditions and period without thinking about refugees, escaping persecution. Ibrahim and Luke both were ref refugees and immigrants simultaneously. All right, so we speak about all the refugees, and now we problematize the refugee, we begin to speak again with a dehumanizing term, chain migration, rather than people needing help. Okay? So what I'm trying to tell you is that in order for us to change the conversation in this country, and it's very important, is to change the conversation of how the framing is to be undertaken. Chain migration is, is done in a very sophisticated way to actually reframe the discussion and to completely problematize the human that is actually needing help rather than addressing the much more complex problem of why migration is taking place, why refugees are occurring and so on. So actually rather than addressing the root causes of the shift of human being, we begin to problematize the person that is arriving at the, at the door. So we no longer can limit and the understanding of why we have the crisis to this rudimentary dehumanization, conceptualization that are taking place. And we need to insist that our, both our religious texts, Muslims, the religious texts, the biblical texts, the Torah and religious traditions, is actually centered on welcoming the stranger. And we need to challenge people that are using religious discourse in this country today as a way of trying to limit and create walls, as a way of thinking that how to solve and address the problem of human beings. People don't leave their homes unless there is some crisis, both economic, political, or war, that leads them to leave their homes, because everybody likes to stay where they are at. So we need to think about how to address the problems that are at the beginning point, rather than to problematize the end. And again, in Europe, there are many phrases that we are here because you were there. Meaning, without colonization, without political, economic intervention, destabilization, uh, globalization, that is, pernicious globalization, we don't end up having these mass people actually being left out without having any safety net, and the end result is for them to migrate without having any sense of protection. So we need to reshift the discussions and the debate, inshallah. <laughs> الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونتوب إليه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون. Now the act of migration always is connected to renewal, which in our tradition is تجديد. And one of the most important part of renewal is building institutions. Wherever a religious community went and migrated, they built institutions. Because individuals can pass their tradition in a very narrow structure to their 
place, immediate circle. But you cannot transfer the totality of the tradition and its meaning unless you have institutions to do so. And again, the history of Islam is about building institutions to transform and transfer all of the collective knowledge that a tradition is about. And again, looking at the history of Islam, whether it's from uh, small schools to institutions that are universities to economic system in terms of awqaf to uh, hospitals, all that was institutions that collectively had managed and continued to transmit collectively the understanding and the tradition of a particular group. If you go, the Catholics, when they arrived to this country, they built institutions. Protestants, when they came to the country, they built institutions. The Buddhists, when they arrived in this country, they built institutions. So institutions makes possible for the continued renewal of the collectivity of the society. Right? So it's, it's a critical piece of migration and renewal. And through that process, you begin to actually contemplate what are your future horizon collectively. And we have many issues in our collective horizons. What is our economic model for our own community? Right? How to understand the various ways a community can develop. Do we have an internal, what you call, apprentice program in the different guilds or different uh, uh, aspects of the businesses? Uh, do we have a way to invest for the future? Do we have a venture capital fund to actually create uh, companies within our own community that will actually benefit and return some of the benefit to the community? Right? Do we have lawyers that actually are not ambulance chasers, but actually chasers of justice? Right? Do we have Muslim uh, hospitals that actually are run by Muslims, so we speak up with, about Ibn Sina in history, we could actually take people to live and see the Ibn Sina of today. Right? That can only happen if we have a collectivity and we have a structure that makes it possible for future ideas to be actually attained and put into practice. Now I'm saying this specifically because I've been engaged in Zaytuna College as an institution, right? the first Muslim accredited institution in the West, not only in America, but in the West. There's nothing in Europe, nothing in the UK, nothing in France, in Germany, in Norway, nothing. This is the only accredited Muslim college, the Royal Arts College in this country. And we are still attempting to build for a future horizon. Meaning, to be able to deal with the multiplicities of issues that we need to think about, a college can make it possible to do so. Because you could engage in research, you could engage in writing, you could actually have a possibility of thinking. I know it's very difficult these days to say I'm thinking, they might arrest you, right? Because it's not highly valued, right? Because we're in an age of talking heads and think tanks that do nothing but actually be in a tank without much thinking taking place. So in order for us to actually take the time for that to occur, we have that institution. So uh, I ask for the master to allow us that we have a fundraiser on uh, Sunday, inshallah, in Santa Clara Marriott. Myself, Imam Zaid, and Sheikh Hamza will be there to give you an update where the college is at. We just recently acquired a really a magnificent property of 9.4 acres. So to give you the plans moving forward and how the community, this is a collective effort uh, in terms of what is taking place. And again, uh, we aspire to create a college. The college is created and now actually how to plan for the next 5, 10 to 15 to 20 years. And collectively, I think this would be the most important contribution in order for us to actually cover the circle from mosque to school to uh, uh, non-profit organizations and community organization to having a college that begins to train individuals that could actually fill the larger context of coming and fulfilling all the roles that are there. So inshallah, if you could take the flyers, there's the flyers uh, that are going to be handed out for you to be inshallah with us uh, on Sunday. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم 
في العالمين انك حميد مجيد اللهم اني داع فامنه اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما اعطيت وقنا واصرف عنا بالخير شر ما قضيت فانك تقضي بالخير ولا يرضى عليك وانه لا يذل من واليك تبارك ربنا وتعالى ربنا ردنا الى الاسلام ردا جميلا ربنا ردنا الى الاسلام ردا جميلا ربنا ردنا الى الاسلام ردا جميلا اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه رب العالمين اللهم ارحم المسلمين والمسلمات الاحياء منهم وال يا رب العالمين اللهم ارحم المسلمين والمسلمات الاحياء منهم والاموات يا رب العالمين اللهم ارحم المسلمين والمسلمات الاحياء منهم والاموات يا رب العالمين اللهم اشف مرضى المسلمين جميعا اللهم اشف مرضى المسلمين جميعا اللهم اشف مرضى المسلمين جميعا اللهم خفف عنهم اللهم خفف عنهم اللهم خفف عنهم يا رب العالمين اللهم انصر انصر الاسلام وعز المسلمين اللهم انصر الاسلام وعز المسلمين اللهم انصر الاسلام وعز المسلمين يا رب العالمين اللهم انا مغلوبون فانصرنا اللهم انا مغلوبون فانصرنا اللهم انا مغلوبون فانصرنا واخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين واقم الصلاه ان الصلاه تنهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر يضيق يعدكم لعلكم تذكرون